There we go. So we're here to talk about the community-led homes and empty homes kind of angle. And we've got Diane Hubbard and Jen McEvitt both here very kindly offering to come and tell us a bit about their experience and what they can shed light on in terms of our conversation in Cumbria and Lancaster area. Um, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. I'm going to encourage you to introduce yourselves. Um, so before we get into the pr presentations, I think just given we're quite a small group, it would be useful to know who we all are. Um, and if you're, if you're happy to, I'd quite like just to go around my screen and get people to say who they are and what their interest is in this conversation. Um, and hopefully we'll catch up with anybody else who joins in as the, if they have uh, things they want to share with us. So I'll let the speakers introduce themselves. If we could start with Becky, as she's first on my screen at the moment. Hi, I'm Becky. Um, uh, by day, I am the Community Housing Advisor for Lancaster City Council. And then I'm also um, founder of a new emerging land trust in Kendall. Thanks, Becky. Charles, you're next on my screen. So I just had to un unmute myself. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Charles E. Croyd. Um, I'm an ACT board member. Uh, I am a board member and chairman of MITRE Housing Association. Um, I've been involved in with them for about through seven or eight years now. Um, I was formerly a uh, former chairman of Cumbria Rural Housing Trust before, uh, unfortunately, it folded. Um, and my um, not my reason for being on the ACT board, but the the I, I bring some experience and knowledge of affordable housing uh, to to the group, um, and uh, just hope I can contribute. Um, in some shape or form today. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. Um, Laurel, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Laurel Sleep, and I'm from Wrigley Solicitors. I'm based in Leeds. Um, so I'm a solicitor and I'm a member of the community led housing team at Wrigley's. Um, so it's an area that I'm really interested in and we work with a lot of clients. Um, so yeah, it's just good to hear what's going on in the sector. So That's great to have you on board. Session. Thank you very much indeed for, for tuning in. That's okay. Morning, everyone. I'm Julie Friend. I work at Copeland Borough Council as the Housing Strategy and Inclusion Officer. So we've got the um, statutory duty to look at housing need across the borough. Um, I lead on um, community-led housing for Copeland, um, but act as our delivery partner um, to help us spend the funding we had from the first tranche and support was secured from Homes England so they're our main delivery person for this. Thanks Julie, thank you. Katie. Hello I'm Katie so I also work at ACT and um, I'm a support officer and I support Fran on the community-led housing hub for Cumbria and Lancaster. That's me. Thank you and Katie makes all these things possible so I'm very grateful for her presence here today. <laughs> um, well, I try. <laughs> Um, David? The joys of using a mobile telephone. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, we can at the moment, yes. Yeah, good morning, uh, David Savage. I'm um, currently sitting on the Millham Town Board uh, as a board member with a particular project that sits in there, which is Empty Homes for Millham. Uh, I also chair Millham Parish Council and the uh, Southern Boundary Partnership, which was part of the extension of the National Park, which is a proposal that's been made uh, to HMG. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it'd be really interesting to hear your view on things. If we can keep hold of you, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Damien. Good morning, everybody. Um, Act Support Officer for West Cumbria. Um, so I've been working with David and Diane on the Millam mm -hmm. Empty Homes project last few months. Um, so again, when this opportunity came up uh, with different people, uh, different interests and, and knowledge, it was important to uh, sign up and sort of hopefully pick people's brains, right? Get as much information as possible. We're on a big learning curve uh, at the moment, eh? So nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Damien. Thank you. 
Um, Leanne, um, we can't see you anymore, but I know you're there. <laughs> Hello, I'm not sure whether you can see me now. <laughs> yes, that's um, better. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, so I'm Leanne Power. I work in the strategic planning team at Crawford and Council. Um, we're currently writing the local plan and there's a number of policies linked with empty homes and so on. It's an issue that we, we would like to address through the planning policies. Um, so I'm keen to find out more about the area, really. It's an area I'm interested in. So looking forward to hearing from you all today. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and Bronwyn, I think you're the last person on my screen. I think, I'm sorry, you've just joined us. We're just doing very brief introductions. It would be nice to hear what you're interested in and what, where you've come from. Um, so I'm um, Bronwyn Kerr. I'm the treasurer of the Petervale Parish Community Land Trust. We're hoping to um, build some um, new houses for affordable rent in the next year. But we're also interested in looking at different sites and repurposing any existing buildings that we can find. <clears throat> Thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you. OK, so that's that's really useful. Um, there are, as I, as I said before, there are a few people who haven't yet joined us who may yet join us um, and we'll get to know who they are if they if they um, introduce themselves along the way. But it's it's lovely to see such a range of interests and people um, here and to know that uh, this I this the interest in reclaiming buildings that are underused or poorly used is 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 so widely um, felt and it, it makes such sense. I, I just wanted to share with you uh, a note I've got from somebody who wanted to be with us but can't this morning um, and she's she's very keen on um, the reuse of empty buildings, em empty buildings in general but empty homes in particular um, and uh, wanting to open up the, the conversation about um, the subdivision of larger homes so that we're providing a different sort of solution to um, housing pressures. Um, also mentioning the pressures created by second homes. It's, a, it's another part of the conversation about homes which are underused. Um, interesting um, addition there. And, and pointing out that all of that goes on before we get into thinking about um, building on um, land which is currently um, serving a different purpose, which you know usually is, is useful in environmental sense in, in terms of flood mitigation, in terms of carbon storage and so on. So really good stuff. And I, I just want to read a line from the, the, the letter she sent. It says, this would better protect wildlife landscapes and green infrastructure at the time when issues around climate change and ecological collapse are, are exacerbated, as well as helping to ensure communities remain vital and viable. And I just think that's, that's perfect, really. It's exactly that. It's trying to make sure that what we're doing is solving the problems we've got in the best way possible and not just continuing this um, the, the build, build, build mantra, if you'll excuse my mildly political jibe there. It's, it's, um, it's difficult to, to see that we're going to be able to build our way out of this without addressing existing housing stock. So, um, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, it, it really does give us an opportunity to use, um, in some cases, buildings which are already significant and important in communities, um, not, not, um, not simply retaining old housing stock but but main, main, maintaining the character of a community um, and, and those sorts of things as well which I think are, are significant for a sense of place. So I won't witter on too long, um, just suffice to say really that Jen has uh, travelled all the way from Sunderland to talk to us this morning um, and uh, will be telling us about a project that's going on over there which it has a really um, sound social motivation um, but interesting what the, the uh, context of that project is, and some, it may resonate with some of us on this side of the country. Um, it, it, may, it may not chime with what, what's going on and where you live, but it's um, interesting to think about um, the challenges of um, uh, the, the, the way the housing market works in your area and what, uh, what the most um, practical steps you can take to address that are. And in Jen's case, they've found a very direct approach to um, tackling with private rental sector. Um, so, and Jen's going to tell us a bit about what um, Back on the Map do in in, uh, in Hendon, and that, that's that, that's going to be um, useful and informative in the sense of showing the scale and ambition from, of growing from uh, uh, what what would I think I think in fairness, Jen, you you didn't set out to do housing, did you? So. Um, the, the, the community have just come to housing as a, as a part of the solution to social fabric issue 
um, and it'll be really interesting to, to catch up on that. Um, and then after Jen, we're going to hand over to Diane, who's who uh, a number of you already know. Uh, Diane's one of our local go-to people um, when we're talking about what we can do with old buildings and making them more environmentally sensible. Um, so we're going to hear a lot about the practicalities of looking at old buildings um, and the, the structure and the problems that they, they, they have uh, that need addressing but also a really sound rationale for, um, for doing it anyway. Uh, that, that it's, it's complicated and difficult, but it's important that we um, really consider our options and try to do this um, a sensible way around. So I'm gonna hand over to Jen. While Jen's talking, if anybody has any questions that arise, can I suggest we don't interrupt, but just pop them in the chat and we can come to them afterwards. We will have a, a handover, a break between the two sessions, just so that we're not uh, sitting and listening for too long, um, but it, it, it will all be interesting stuff. And if something occurs to you along the way, please just stick it in the chat function and we'll make sure we talk about things as much as we can. I really don't want anyone to feel that debate is being stifled here. We want to hear from you and we want to discuss what you want to discuss. So over to you, Jen. Katie, have I done everything I should have done? Um, <laughs> it, it, Rana, are, you, are you running the presentation that we sent oh. over? Yes, I can do that for you. Yes. Um, Hello, everybody. Anyway, by the way, hi, I'm Jen. So um, I'm chief exec of a, of a charity in Sunderland, um, which I'm going to tell you all about um, very shortly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to hear how much is happening across in Lancashire and Cumbria. Um, it seems like community-led housing is definitely on the rise, isn't it? Is everybody seeing that now? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, so it could have been either of us, yeah. So we're, we're called Back on the Map. Um, the, we were named Back on the Map as a, a, a part of the community consultation, although some people say on the back map, which isn't entirely helpful. But um, uh, anyway, yeah, we're Back on the Map. Back of the map used to be the New Deal for Communities for Hendon in Sunderland, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with. Um, it was a government programme, it was a labour intervention. Um, there were 39 NDCs across England. Um, back of the map in Sunderland is one of them. Um, and we ran um, the government intervention from 2001 to 2011. Um, can I have the next slide, please, like Fran? Um, sorry, can I go on another one? Yeah, so um, towards the end of the NDC, the New Deal for Communities, um, we did a major consultation exercise. It took months, there was a lot involved in it. Um, and we could put that um, resource into it at the time because yeah, we were an NDC and we had 28 or 30 staff at the time. So what we did was before we closed the New Deal for Communities programme, and um, you know, switched over to becoming just um, a, a self-financing charity. Um, yeah, we did a major consultation exercise, um, and we asked people what problems were. Um, so what they told us, pretty loud and clear, was that the scale of the private sector was a problem, um, and we we knew that because of some research that we had funded from the Chartered Institute of Housing. Um, so yeah, there's um, more than 850 private rented sector properties in two neighbourhoods. So you can imagine what that does to those two neighbourhoods. And yeah, it's up to 80% of, of the, the housing in some of those streets. When those landlords don't particularly want to invest in the properties, um, which was the majority of landlords, sadly. Um, yeah, the housing fabric begins to deteriorate. Um, they become unlettable. Then they're empty homes. The empty homes attract fly tipping, arson all sorts of vandalism and damage. Um, and then some of the tenants that they, they did have in those properties or still do, um, don't have um, a stake in the community, um, don't, you know, don't behave particularly well, um, leave the rubbish line all over, the, um, and it's just an absolute state. Um, and then there was an awful lot of antisocial behavior because there's a lot of antisocial behavior, people move around a lot. Um, this chaotic lifestyle, so it creates a lot of churn and low social resilience. So the sense of community is completely eroded and local people feel powerless 
um, and really don't have a voice and it's all just basically happening around them. So you can get, um, I hope you do anyway, get the impression from that and understand that um, private rented sector properties um, and empty homes, you know, they don't just create a bit of a problem in areas like Hendon where there's low property values. They absolutely devastate it physically in terms of yeah, physical dereliction and um, yeah, the erosion of any sense of community spirit. Um, so Fran, sorry, could you go back to the previous one now? I realised that the version that Joanne sent you was, uh, was uh, not quite the right one. Yeah, so what we did in response to that um, was, was devise our three strategic objectives. So that's what they are. We want to build a better place, a stronger community and an influencing role for residents. Um, so it's, it's, it's very clear, it's very simple and it's pretty direct and everything that we do must um, fall under one of those um, objective headings. And then that diagram on the, on the right there, it's our um, wheel of uh, virtual sustainability, virtual. Um, so yeah, we've got our aims, the, well, the, the overall um, aims, the strategic objectives, the actions and the outcome. So you probably can't see the detail in that, but if it needs a bit refreshing to be fair, um, but that's what we do. So everything is done for a purpose and there's, there's nothing that's kind of willy nilly or outside of our remit. Um, and part of the reasons that we need to have that clarity um, is because as, as a former New Deal for Communities, um, they were quite um, unpopular bodies in some ways um, because it is a government intervention. But um, yeah, so we absolutely need to be clear and, and simple about what we do. It's not 49 stretching uh, government set targets. It's just three that are directly about what the community wanted. So we can move on from there, Fran, please. Yeah, and then next, yeah. So partly the reason why local people were saying those were the problems is because of things like this. Um, and this isn't, uh, um, you know, this type of issue isn't in isolation in Hendon, it's all over the place. So yeah, you can see that properties have been broken into, squatted, um, you know, that the, the Things are dumped all over the place. There's their very poor workmanship. The houses deteriorate and it just becomes, you know, very unpleasant for people that are living there. So unlike most private landlords, that's exactly where we head. <laughs> um, we, we, we specifically target properties like that, um, which we then need to transform. So can we have the next slide, please, Fran? Fran? Sorry, Fran. <laughs> Okay, um, so under our better place objective, yeah, since since we put the objectives in place, we've bought and refurbished um, 86. It's growing all the time because we've got another four. Um, just recently bought and under refurbishment, in fact, a conversion from two to three beds. Um, so yeah, obviously fewer empty homes, fewer private landlords, and that creates more local control. Um, you can tell that, you know, if we've got 80, 85 to 90 prop properties to snow, um, we've got 10% of what that private rented sector stock was that we've taken in. So it will take us years, um, a long, long time to kind of reverse that um, decline and, and balance the scales a bit, but that's what we'll do however long it takes. Um, yeah, so all properties are fairly, fairly refurbished. They, they, they meet and exceed decent home standards. We vet and check tenants very carefully because we need to have um, good tenants that become good neighbours and then stabilise previously very, very fraught neighbourhoods. Um, we do want to let to local people. So yes, we've got a local lettings policy. Um, we provide responsive repairs. Our, our repairs we've got our in-house repairs team. Um, you just saw the van actually, one of our vans outside of one of those properties. Um, so yeah, it's really important that w w when we m take the decision to become a private landlord, um, to, to do it differently, that we are better than the, than the landlords that have been criticised in the past. It must be that we hold our principles and um, values and do a good job. And that is really, really important. Um, and that, yeah, we're there for community, we respond rapidly. 
um, yeah, all our homes are licensed. We've also got, we've bought and refurbished um, four empty shops on our shopping parade. And those are turned into things like, um, one's called the workshop. Um, it's, uh, it's a wood workshop, um, community kitchen kind of co-production space for micro enterprises. Um, we've got back on the map homes premises, which is basically looks like a, an estate agent style. Um, and we've got a couple of other shops that we're converting as well. And we've also got a community center, which is a former um, Carnegie library taken over from the council. Um, so basically um, the picture that I showed you before about the empty homes, the physical dereliction, um, the antisocial behavior, it just creates this massive vir uh, vicious cycle um, where you know people are, are leaving Hendon on mass because there's, there's, there's nobody that seems to be able to do anything about that problem. Um, and what we're trying to do and, and are doing is creating a virtuous cycle um, where it's, it's sustainable and viable. So those are, those are pictures of some of the, the properties that we've done up. And this is about how we cluster them. So there is there's absolutely zero point in just buying random properties. Um, so these two neighborhoods here, um, there's a cluster of little red dots up there towards the top um, left-hand corner. And there's a, a cluster towards the, the middle right. Um, those are the areas with the highest concentrations of private rented sector. So that is exactly where we target our properties. And you can, there's actually, we, we, I haven't been able to update this because I haven't got the tech on my computer, but there's a lot more red dots than, than, than those and the red dots are our properties. So you can see that we, we, we do a cluster and actually it doesn't take that many properties to, to shift the dynamic. So um, we will only venture into a street if we know that eventually we'll be able to buy enough properties to, to, to do that, to tip the balance. And it is hugely important um, because we don't have the funds just to, you know, buy in random places and hope it works. We need to adopt an intelligent clustering strategy. So can I have the next one, Fran, please? Um, yeah, this is just a wee bit about our journey. Um, so in the immediate post NDC days, um, we were entirely government funded. Um, the the government give you six months to close. Um, and then after that, there's basically nobody will fund you because you're a former government department. <laughs> so not the charity um, lottery and, and other philanthropic sources um, yeah, are pretty much not interested. And as anybody who's familiar with NDCs will know, it was a bit of a gravy train um, for a lot of public and private sector bodies. So um, yes, we had to deal with um, uh, some legal cases where those private companies were trying to basically get more out of us. So we, we took two years to fight that off and actually two years to close the programme, not because of, of lack of energy on our part, but because that's how long DCLG take. Um, so we, our, our, our goal there was just to survive because we had no income and quite a lot of, of wolves at, at the door. Um, and at that point, Gen 2 managed our homes because the DCLG um, would not allow a, a new deal for committees to get into a venture that they didn't have a remit to enter. So it was a, a ridiculous catch 22. So yes, we, we do want to get into housing, but we can't get into housing because we haven't been in housing before. So it, that's, that was a, an awkward one. So yeah, we, we, we asked Gen 2, which is a big um, social landlord in Sunderland to manage our properties. And then our next goal was as soon as we'd kind of achieved survival for two years was to rationalize so to stop the outflow of funds and um, we brought the housing management in-house um, in order to achieve that and at that point we had 62 houses um, we had to complete the refurbishments um, DCLG removed clawback and, and we and then rather than having a four million pound hole in our accounts um, um, yeah, that was reversed when they actually became our assets. Um, because like any other fund, uh, government funded body, yeah, those assets don't belong to you at, at, at that point. And then um, from there on, our goal really was to thrive. We, we submitted a tender and got the library on a 25 year lease. We secured a, a large lottery grant. We started buying seven um, 
more empty homes and refurbish them and we achieved our reserves target so um yeah we, we began to thrive and then the current strategy um which we're just almost at the end of yeah we pulled together um a, a house purchase fund um we've we've bought and refurbished another 24 houses um and yeah things we are in the process of growing and normally we would be um I would have drafted the next business growth plan already, but currently we're we're probably going to go for a consolidation strategy. So, okay, Fran, can I have the next one? Am I taking too long, by the way? Um, just five more minutes, Jen, if you can do that. Yeah, yeah sure, that's fine. Um, so part of this slide is, um, yeah, we don't work in isolation. We absolutely do not. So part of our part of uh, my approach in writing this succession strategy and all our all our strategies is that we do not duplicate what any other voluntary organisation is doing, and and that was my approach from the outset. You know, back on the map as a new deal for communities, um, funded um, the, the 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 voluntary and charity sector for ten years previously. So we're not going to now set up in competition with them. Um, so yeah, we we work with. So in terms of if there's provision to be delivered in the Carnegie Corner, then we don't try and do it ourselves. We raise the funds and we work with partners, um, and yeah, we we get them to do it. And because our our centres are really really well used, um, all these partners do want to work with us because basically we provide a lot of bums on seats. So it works quite well. So we don't try and, and um, provide services in an area that we don't have expertise. We bring in the experts and the experts are happy to do that because it takes everybody's boxes and it brings a whole load of specialist services to the community that otherwise wouldn't be able to access them. Yes, yeah, so a lot of partnerships. Um, right, okay. In terms of our um, business model, um, we've got a small staff team so we have to make the numbers stack up. So when I say small staff team, well, yeah, we've got 12 full-time equivalent now, but we used to have four and that's grown quite rapidly in the past couple of years. Well, it's trebled in fact, in the past couple of years. Um, but what we don't do is rely on our housing revenue, um, our, our rental income to support our staff costs where possible. So where there's free money, we will be looking to secure it. So we look, for grants as far as possible to support the costs of all our community services and then the income from housing services pays for part of that and then crucially um, it also pays for for three key um costs so and this is hugely important so the the third we we allocate a third of our income straight away for responsive repairs dump and roof remediation and long-term renewal so um we have to up maintain our assets and we have to uphold our reputation and standing in the community so yeah, we have a responsive repairs budget where we know that you know however many hundreds of calls we get a year we can get somebody out we can carry out that repair and you know we are not falling into um poor reputation and poor housing standards and um, so you have to budget for that um and then yes because of our area we've got a uh, uh, sometimes I have fantasies about having a, a more modern housing stock on the top of a hill somewhere, but not where we're in the bottom. Um, it's Victorian. Some most of them are single leaf brick, and they're a nightmare. <laughs> uh, so we have a we have a separate um, damp remediation um, and roof budget, um, and yeah, long term news. So we do a stock condition survey. We identify the um, when every component, window, boiler, door, electric circuits and things like that were installed, what's their lifespan, what's the cost to replace them, and then we've got a very large database or spreadsheet with um, uh, a budget attached to it, so you have to budget for that so that in 10, 25, 30 years when you need um, 35 new roofs, 20 bathrooms, um, all that, that we actually have the funds set aside for it. So. I don't know one other community-led housing provider that's got that, but we we do, and I would strongly suggest that you do do. Um, yeah, about a third of our rental covers covers some of our core costs, and then we generally have a, a six-figure surplus that we invest in more houses. Um, so yeah, Fran, I'll just jump onto that next one if you like. 
Um, so part of our challenges is the area. Yes, yeah, so I've just mentioned that like physically it's a challenging area. The scale of the problem is massive. Um, and we are we are um, a, you know scratching away at that and and making sure that we that we do challenge it and set a different um, standard. Um, starting from scratch isn't easy, as everybody would know. And even when you get to four or five million pounds, every single time that property and those metrics have to stack up. And if it doesn't, we don't do it. Um, simple as really. And then we need to keep a, a control of the cost and making the numbers work. We also have to, we work quite hard to make sure that residents are in close contact with us because they assume that we are Gen 2 um, and then they expect all, the, all that kind of social housing, um, which to be honest with you, ours is, ours is generally better than that. But anyway, they, they seem to have different expectations of us altogether. Um, also, you know, you need to be, have people in the organisation who have housing skills, which is quite tough. Um, developing systems, we're we're looking at reviewing and, and uh, incorporating a new CRM, and just the growing pains because it looks you'd think that all of that metrics is is pretty straightforward and you just get on and do it. Well, actually, sometimes growing the organisation and still making the metrics works, that's pretty challenging. And then the last slide, Fran. Um, but we do have ambitions. <laughs> we always do. So. Um, yeah, basically, we need to own or manage um, most of the non-occupier non stock in Hendon because um, that's what will properly tip the balance. So as well as owning properties, um, we also manage uh, about 40 other properties just now. And the, the purpose of that is to extend beyond our budget um, and, you know, obviously have a bigger impact. Um, we want to reverse those like decades and this is the buy to let phenomenon that you probably um experience in, in 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 on the west side of the country especially in um rural areas where the second homes well we're trying to make the case that it's people with 40 second homes 50th homes um and yeah obviously we want to pre um stabilize fraught communities so that's that's really kind of sorry in, in a very rushed um nutshell what we do and how we do it but I'm happy to um, take questions or criticism. Brilliant, Jen. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just put the presentation away. Okay, we're back. Um, that was really, really good to hear. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for sharing all of your experience and um, and learning. I, can I, if I can just try and pick out a few of the things that I was hearing, um, it was... I think I, I really like your three um, sort of principles and I can see how your stronger community um, through creating a better place is exactly what we're trying to do here. And the idea of getting your community to be more engaged in where they live so that they've really got a stake in it is absolutely right. It's a positive cycle of energy and gain and everybody's winning and it's, it's, it's going to work, it's great notwithstanding the uh, cost and the um, difficulties along the way. Um, just observing that your, 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 your thoughts about the private rented sector are deeply entrenched and that there's, there's um, uh, you know, as you put it, you're reversing decades of neglect. It's not just something that's happened overnight. It's something that people have got very used to. Their expectations are not yours and you're trying to spread a, a different view of how things can be. And that, that's also quite a a significant challenge but obviously people want to do that with you and that, that you know you, you've created something which is enormously positive here um and the the fact that although housing must be a main a, a feel like a major part of what you're doing now um that's not where you started and the partnerships that you've had in the past have led you to do all sorts of other things which are about community support and helping people to, to make good choices and, and uh, you know, and lead healthier lives in, in places where they don't always feel good about themselves. So um, I, I think it's an enormously positive project and, I, and it's really interesting because it's, it's quite different from a, a number of other approaches that we hear about. So thank you again for, for, um, for sharing that with us. Um, there were some things that went into the chat. Um, let me just see if I can find them. Um, People getting straight to the matter. <laughs> um, 
David, do you want to chip in with a couple of your questions? You, you, you mentioned a few things. Um, you mentioned about possibly supporting those who are moving on. I don't know how you deal with that, Jen. That seems a, an interesting part of the equation here. Um, and then some questions about your, uh, the structure and, and how you make sure your, your um, meeting standards and, and, and rent and so on. Um, if we spend a few minutes just going through what's up there now, Jen, if, if, if it feels yeah. like it's opening up into a much bigger conversation, then perhaps we can do Diane's presentation before we get really into the nitty gritty. But it, it's worth, if there's things there you can deal with fairly swiftly, that would be great. Um, Jen. Start at what looks like the, the, the top for me, which is probably the first one at, um, from Damien. So yeah. um, regarding the purchase of the units, was there enforcement by the council? No. Um, even though, um, in fact, back on the map, paid for selective licensing over five years in Hendon, um, the, the council was very reluctant to use their powers and, and used a softly, softly approach far more than often. And I think that wasn't so much about um, what was happening with the team and, and selective licensing. Um, they were very, very keen to, um, to, to use their powers, but the legal department, not so much. So no, we we've bought we've got um, very good relationships actually with most of the landlords. Most of the land private sector landlords know that we buy, um, and yeah, by far most of our properties have been bought from from private sector landlords. Who interestingly, and I don't know if you're finding this in your area, but because in the last three for three years, um, the the whole market for private rented sector has changed. So the the mortgage um, tax rules have changed. Universal credit has changed. Um, well, universal credit has been rolled out, um, and there are um, lettings agents are now being regulated. So a whole load of them have left the market. So it's more difficult for absent rogue landlords, for want of a, a, a more fair phrase, to 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 just to get houses and roll them out. So financially. Um, a lot of experienced private landlords are leaving the market. Um, and what's worrying is, is that a lot of new inexperienced private landlords are, in, are filling that gap. So it's really, really important that if you see that happening, that you, that you, you know, we all try and do something about it. So, but no, in terms of the reason that Back on the Map's doing it is because it is not anybody's statutory duty. The, the housing market is, unless it's social housing, is, is unregulated. So anybody can buy anything and do what the hell they like with it. Um, and that's where the problem stems from, I think. But um, I mean, we did work closely with the council in trying to access empty homes grants where possible, but the, in terms of powers, no, the council didn't use those. Um, so somebody's asked, David, where do the existing residents move to? Um, and how are the people with chaotic lives? Well, we support them through our community services largely, and we're developing a whole new program basically around chaotic lifestyles. We had um, one of one of our tenants who we supported for three years, um, who basically fell off the wagon big time. Um, his house is now being used pretty much as a crack den. He arrived at, at our premises um, early Friday morning with no shoes, a pair of trousers and no top and absolutely um, is it, we've had to cap off the gas. The place was flooded. Um, there are needles galore. Um, so talking about supporting people with chaotic lifestyles is really tough, especially in a place where there are so many people with chaotic lifestyles. You know, you, you know, you're not going to move to, you know, a retreat. Um, but in terms of, of where do those other people move to? Well. Um, sometimes the move area but, and because Hendon is, is right next to Sunland City Centre um, it, is, it is a transient place in the first place and it used to have a lot of student population as well so it's one of those transient areas that um, it's not an outlying peripheral estate it's right next to the city centre it's very, you know you can just imagine it Victorian accommodation and, and people come and go all the time so the people that, that come from outside the area we would kind of like them to move back out the area actually because they bring problems. And I know that sounds very right off, but you know, I'm focusing on what's good for my community. Um, that's not you, to say and, that- And to the one local lettings policy, Jane, because that's quite an interesting one. 
it's a big yeah. debate over here where so there's a, maybe one or two providers that have deliberately stayed out of choice-based lettings policy, so all the providers are in together and there's a, a core um, yeah. election policy I, for that. Are you in uh, like a, a local one with Gen 2 and stuff, or you just do your own? We do our own. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of rationale potentially for saying, actually, we'll, we'll allow people in, you know, who have got jobs, who want to settle in the area, who, who bring a common influence and all that. But the yeah. first priority for us must be local families. Right, okay. Um, da, 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 da. Rents. Um, basically, we, we are a private rented sector landlord, so um, we can charge whatever rent we like, but we, we charge basically around about uh, local housing allowance. Mm -hmm. And local housing allowance in Sunderland isn't particularly high. Um, and obviously that's factored into people's housing benefit or universal credit. So we, we try and make them as affordable as possible. Um, so can, can, can I ask then, is it like, a, so, so is it affordable rent or social housing rent or, or and do you add service charge on that there as part no, of there's no, no service charges and it's all based on local housing allowance. So because we are not an RP, yeah. a registered provider, um, uh, we we don't have to provide rents at affordable um, ah, okay. rates or, or or social, um, and but and we have looked at becoming an RP three times now, and um, basically the 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 loss of twenty percent. So affordable rent is eighty percent of market rent, mm -hmm. um, and we cannot write off twenty percent of our income. Um, it, even we had a, a a house purchase model with with 90% grant in, and even then it was make, it was making the heart to stack up uh, in the long term, because you can never change those rents. Um, okay, yeah. right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try and tie this up a bit now, because yeah. I think some of what we've got coming through on these questions will come out again after Diane's spoken, so that's great. We've got a question about training and employment opportunities, which I think is really interesting. But can we come back to that, Becky? Is that okay? We'll come back to that after Diane's spoken. Um, Di uh, uh, Damien's got lots more questions for you, and, and maybe we can come back to some of that um, detail um, if we need to, Damien. We can set up a separate conversation, I'm sure, but we might we might have time to do some of this later. Um, and Becky's asking very directly if she can have a copy of your lettings policy to have a look at, because we're all about borrowing from other people. And it would be really interesting to see how you've dealt with um, some of the difficult things that you're um, you're confronted with. So that, you know, that's entirely up to you, Jen, but that would be really interesting to see. Um, I, I think we do need to move on. If, if people are comfortable, we'll just listen to what Diane's got to say, completely different take on the whole subject, coming from a very different um, position and um, uh, interest in, in the fabric of the buildings, really. Um, but nonetheless, um, very powerfully motivated and um, working with communities and businesses and individuals and, um, you know, others who are involved in um, keeping buildings um, usable and also thinking more broadly about what we need to make better use of our existing housing stock and so on. So um, I'm sorry to sort of rush us along, but I'm going to get Diane to do her her words now and then we can hopefully continue this really useful and interesting conversation after that because I think it will open up a few other issues as well which is great <laughs> okay thanks over to you Diane oh you're still on mute <laughs> uh, Katie could you give me host can you make me host Actually, no, Fran, you need to do it because you're host, sorry. You can I'm just a co-host. Share function, Diane, if, if you, can you see that at the bottom of the screen? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, you should be able to uh, see it. No. No, I can't. can't you? No. Okay, okay, um, let me see. Can you do it via the participants list? Yeah, one? just do, it. under more it is, and just hand me the host. There you go. Over Great, you. thank you. So hopefully you might be seeing 
my screen. That looks good. Uh, if only I could see which one I'm meant to be clicking. Oh, um, yeah. I had to make the screen smaller so I could see this slide sh show. Uh, it's that one, isn't it? I think. No. Okay. Have you got a black bar across the top? Is that what the I have, is? and I can't actually see what I'm. Uh, I'm trying to, the top, to top right corner and just make your current screen use that button. That's it, and you might be able to see it now. Yeah. Okay. It? Yeah. That should work. Great. Okay. Well done, Diane. Thank you. You seeing much. that? Yes. You seeing that? All right. Great. Okay. Yeah. So, and the, as they say, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. Let me introduce myself. Um, so, yeah, the focus of my presentation is uh, about buildings, really, and the things that are involved in trying to reclaim buildings. Um, whether that's existing domestic buildings or ones that are used for other purposes at the moment. So in terms of who I am, um, I'm, uh, I've am i sort of come to this through a general interest in, in older buildings. Um, so my research area, the, the photo here is actually uh, uh, buildings that I've researched in the past. They're Lakeland Housing Trust properties uh, in Little Langdale. Um, and uh, I, my research is related to improving the performance of older buildings and moisture and all those things we have to bear in mind when we're living in houses. And in terms of what I do, um, I, I'm quite heavily evol involved in uh, retrofits, particularly in relation to practical testing of buildings and investigations. So things like, um, uh, testing uh, houses pre-refurbishment or post-refurbishment. Um, I do investigations if things have gone wrong, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, some of the things I do really are involve things like thermal imaging uh, as a tool for uh, helping people to decide what to do or where issues remain. And I do a lot of work in relation to energy assessment. My general background is I'm an engineer and I try and apply engineering principles to buildings. And um, I'm also a passive house consultant. So I'm familiar with um, quite uh, ranges of uh, um, energy performance. Uh, my heart really lies with older buildings though, because you know it's so important that um, you know, we clearly value them for a variety of reasons, but we also need to make sure that um, you know, we're working with those buildings, but improving their energy performance. So I'm trying to merge all of these different things in the work that I do. So um, thinking about what the, um, the reason is, why we're wanting to uh, reclaim these empty buildings, you know, we're trying to make them easy to heat, cheap to heat and comfortable to live in. Um, and I know they sound, that sounds quite fundamental, but unfortunately, I spend quite a lot of my time uh, looking at buildings which, which in theory should be doing that, but don't in reality. Um, that, that's through a combination of things. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is a very short presentation I'm doing, but hopefully I can at least give you a little taste of some of the issues that are involved that really need further exploration. But it is quite a common thing. And I have to say with new built properties as well, that there is this gap between where we think they should be performing, what's been designed on paper and what actually, uh, what, how they're actually performing um, in reality. So are they really delivering those low fuel bills that were expected? Are they, are they cheap to heat? Are they comfortable? Are, or are there still issues with those? So the things I'm gonna consider are, um, the physical stuff when we're talking about what what we should be thinking about when we're improving um, uh, our building stock a little bit about thinking about carbon impact i mean this is 
clearly a, a very important area, but it, it's risen in um, priorities very rapidly, and that in itself has create, it created some issues. And then talk about the benefit of upskilling, uh, you know, uh, the people that are involved in the refurbishment process. OK, so thinking about improving the housing stock, we need to sort of try and break that down a little bit more. Um, so when we're thinking about repurposing buildings, there's, of course, the obvious things related to planning, but, um, you know, specific things that come up uh, that, that might be a problem um, are things like, you know, planning required for maybe what we'd view as relatively trivial things. So if perhaps a um, external wall insulation, the insulation applied to the outside of, of the building is going to take place. You know, there's a permission needed to on that to, to overhang the pavement. If say there's got to be a change to a roof line, that needs planning permission. So it goes beyond the obvious stuff, like we need to do something in relation to an extension at the back of a, a, of a property. Um, there's also issues related to um, things like disability access. Um, so, for example, you know, SLDC, for example, have a requirement that new builds comply to um, a certain um, uh, level of access. You know, there may be a desire to make sure that any refurbishment is also uh, uh, having these higher standards uh, uh, in terms of access uh, applied to it. We've also got when we're thinking about maybe larger properties that are perhaps going to be divided or perhaps a non-domestic building that's going to be converted to living accommodation, the specific things that have got to be allowed for there. So things like improved sound insulation, of course, the fire uh, fire precautions. Um, there are things like um, drainage, um, you know, avoiding, say, uh, um, soil pipes from a, a first floor flat, a house that's say been split, split into two properties, uh, soil pipes going through the property below, um, th that, that sort of issue. So the specific things that, that need to be taken into account when they are, um, when uh, units are divided. Um, another significant thing is that, you know, when you are looking at significant uh, improvements in terms of thermal performance, there can be quite a significant loss of space if you're looking of, say, at, say, internally insulating uh, properties. You know, in itself, it might look at a relatively small amount, but on a, on a building that's, say, restricted from a a space point of view anyway, or a particularly narrow kitchen, then, then you could be making a space unworkable. So that is something to, uh, to be bearing in mind. Thinking a bit more about um, sort of building fabric, um, you know, a high proportion of our housing stock in Cumbria um, is, is stone or uh, solid brick construction. Um, now, that that creates some issues, and when you're looking at, um, at at how buildings should be changed, and you're talking to professionals about that, there are a couple of things um, to bear in mind. When you're looking at older stock, you know that that when it was originally built, that was done. Uh, there are no damp proof courses. Um, it may have been uh, built, they may have been built using uh, lime based materials, for example. So there can be quite a lot of moisture movement um, within the building fabric itself, sort of uh, rising damp uh, up, through, uh, up, up through walls where there being no DPC. Um, and if you uh, treat those walls in a way where in effect moisture is trapped within the wall, so in a, a wall sandwiched, um, you have to be quite careful about where that moisture is going to go so that it doesn't uh, produce uh, uh, issues in the future. So you're looking about maybe a, a particular choice of materials in that instance. Different, but maybe you know if we look if you're looking at perhaps a, a more recent non-domestic building, maybe something that was sort of post-war. Um, you've you've perhaps got other issues over maybe you know how uh, if it say may it be a concrete frame building, it could have tremendous issues over what we call thermal bridges. So particular points in the in the 
the makeup of the wall where heat is conducted through the wall more easily. So, so really what I'm saying with, with when you're looking at potential choices of building, you need to think about the, uh, the implications from the, build, the, the building that you're looking at you know, uh, what are its characteristics and what needs to be taken into account. Clearly, professionals that you're working with will, uh, you know, give guidance on that, but but they can lead to very different potential treatments of, of buildings which superficially might appear reasonably similar. Um, above all, when you're looking at upgrading um, uh, uh, buildings to dwellings or, or, uh, or dwellings themselves, you've got to think um, holistically about what's going to be happening in that building. Um, I mean, a, a lot of you are used to dealing with rented properties, so the issues of moisture, uh, you know, damp problems, condensation, uh, lack of ventilation, people not opening windows, all those sort of issues you're probably very familiar with. The thing that happens when you're looking at lower energy buildings is that they become more even more important then than they are now because you're you're sort of tightening the parameters on everything. So uh, you have to get the ventilation right. It has to be something that needs to perform because it's you're not you've not got sort of drafts as many drafts going through the property so that is a significant sort of extra concern or extra issue that has to be dealt with when you're you're looking at refurbishing properties so it's not just a case of let's put lots more insulation in or reduce the airflow the unwanted airflow through the building this air tightness improving the air tightness or just looking at the ventilation, you're looking at all three and it's the combination of all three as well. So that really is the, the sort of the key takeaway from when you're, things to start thinking about when you're looking at, at improving um, existing housing stock. So what I've got here, um, this is just an example to give you perhaps a better idea of, of, of the sort of things I'm talking about. I have to say this this uh, photograph is from it's actually from a new build um, property. Um, to illustrate that the problem isn't all about refurbishment, it's it's a problem um, with uh, uh, buildings as a as a whole, new builds as well as uh, as refurbishment. Um, this is a photograph in somebody's bedroom and uh, at the the, uh, the image on the left is purple is the coldest area and the, um, the, the yellows up to white are, are much warmer. And what we're seeing is the, the corner here in this, this image. And this house is really well insulated. Um, it was only constructed in 2019, um, but the householder can't keep parts of the house warm and the reason for that is is what's actually been done when when uh, in most houses these days uh, plasterboard is used and it's fixed by in effect putting dabs of adhesive on the plasterboard to hold it onto the wall um, and that's not the right way to do it when you actually look at all the manufacturers information that they supply they say you've got to have a continuous uh, sort of bead of insulation around the perimeter of every piece of plasterboard but people just don't fit it that way unless they're instructed otherwise and this is a well-known Cumbrian house builders property and what we've got here is actually what's happening is cold air is getting behind this plasterboard because it's not all been sealed around the edge and it's cooling that wall to the extent in this property that there is a risk of condensation in those corners, so there's a risk of mould. And this is a house that's that's only just been built. So when you're thinking about um, upgrades, this is sort of an example of the sort of thing that you need to at least be aware of. The process, it's not straightforward, it's complex. You, 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 the, the you, you are relying on the professional advice that 
that you get. But this is sort of an example of, of something that can quite typically go wrong. And when I'm doing um, assessments, you know, in the last week, I've I think I've done four and on three out of the four, I have found this problem, basically. So it really is a very common problem. So it really is quite complex. The upgrading is and though that combination of the th improving the thermal performance, improving the air tightness, but making sure the ventilation is right. Is quite a difficult balance to get sometimes. Um, I th I th an important part when you're looking at retrofits is to have a quantified objective. Um, I've got an engineering background. I'm used to sort of working to numbers and definite things. And the, one of the problems with, with uh, both our new build and our retrofit in industry is it isn't really people do what they think is. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just me, but like just give me injury and the standards that we apply to. Um, yeah. Sorry. I, th I think uh, uh, we're just having a bit of slurring Hello. from you, Diane. No problem. <laughs> Which is, um, and uh, I'm just going to have to speed you along just a little bit as well. Can I just give you a five minute warning? Oh, OK. Yeah, no problem. OK, yep. OK, so standards are, are important. Um, so trying to provide something to measure against. If I can just highlight in this slide, um, there are some standards coming in currently called PAS 2035. Um, which can be applied to um, uh, ret which aim to be applied at retrofits, but it's all at a very early stage at this moment. Um, so, um, but, but that offers you know, a, a potential route for ensuring um, standards, but there are other alternatives such as um, uh, NFIT or uh, something called the ACB standards, but we've got a lack of retrofit skills currently. But in all of this, you know, we're talking about quite deep retrofits potentially. Don't look overlook the basics. So, you know, locally we've got cold to cozy homes and um, Eco3 is also available um, until uh, March next year. Uh, carbon impact, um, it's, this is all at a really early stage. Lots of people are talking about it, but it is a real problem in terms of how is it actually assessed at the moment. Um, you've got to be clear about what, whether you're comparing apples with apples or whether it's apples and oranges. Um, it's clearly, from a carbon point of view, the carbon has already been spent on that original build. It makes most sense to, uh, uh, to actually uh, refurbish. Um, but it, you need to take into account both in-use carbon and uh, the carbon embodied in the materials that you're using. Uh, there's a temptation to look at um, uh, petroleum-based materials. Um, clearly, different carbon, uh, different materials have wildly different carbon Im uh, impacts. Um, but things like transport footprint, um, we're going to be hearing a lot more about carbon sequestering materials, so sort of more what we perceive as natural materials, but they clearly have the ability to hold carbon, but also the lifespan of them in use. Some of the products that we're putting into uh, retrofits uh, now are um, have a relatively short lifespan, or if they're used inappropriately, will have a short lifespan. But also thinking about what's going to happen next time that the building has, has to be uh, refurbished, such as windows replaced in sort of 20 or 30 years time. If I could just touch on upskilling, um, you know, the amounts we're talking about in terms of retrofit are phenomenal nationally. We're looking at something that basically matches the new build sector that could be spent. It is a tremendous local opportunity in terms of, uh, you know, money that could go into the local economy. But one of the problems we've got at the moment is things like 
Eco3 and um, some of the green, most of the green homes grant stuff is not actually delivered by local companies. So it really offers a massive potential opportunity. If you can get the skills locally and local businesses engaged in delivery on this, you know, they're relying on their, you know, their reputation locally. They make sure they do a good job. But you as sort of potential local providers can really help to drive this forward. Um, but they're really the, the, there is such a gap there locally, you know, within the county at the moment over over local skills on retrofit. This is a, a the photograph here is some retrofit training taking place. Um, but there that's it's there's nothing really happening in the local colleges at the, as yet, which is it has to change. Can I just raise finally, um, sort of picking up something that was mentioned before, um, be aware that a consultation has just closed on the private rented sector on what may be happening in the future. From 2025, if the consultation was, in, was brought in, what they're proposing to do is from 2025, make all new tenancies minimum of a SAP band C on, uh, on, on properties. Um, it's currently E and there's a lot of properties that are not conforming to E still. Um, that would come in later for existing tenancies, but that could radically change things because this movement of, of, of people may be drop, landlords dropping out of the sector could be an opportunity, A, to buy properties, but also you've got to bear in mind that properties have got, you know, if this comes in, properties will, will uh, have to comply to that, that standard of energy performance. Sorry, I was talking a bit too slowly. Do apologize, I'll hand back now. That's brilliant, Diane. You can hear me, can't you? I'm still here. I can. Good, okay. Um, great stuff. Okay, I'm just trying to catch up with what's gone on in the chat, if there's anything new going on there. Um, yes, Damien's chipped in. Um, just to say thank you very much, Diane, that covered some really interesting stuff and, um, you know, not least highlighting the foibles of um, local housing stock, but general, you know, general mm. elderly housing stock issues and, and uh, really important to acknowledge that the mistakes that people are still making in building homes with um, weaknesses that, that we're, you know, we will still have to be addressing. It's all part of that skills um, and updating skills thing that, you, that you're, you're alluding to that we we just need um, more resources going into making housing better that, that it's as simple as that isn't it mm -hmm. wherever it at whichever stage in the journey <clears throat> but there's um I think make a, a pretty good case for um, recognizing the value of the existing building not just from its charm and character point of view but from its embodied carbon um, that you know the work that's gone into it the fact that it's already there <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the you know the, there's a, there's a great deal to be said for making use of what already exists um, where it makes sense, um, and I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned things like the um, the, the compromises people will have to make on um, use of space with internal insulation and so on, and the, those those kinds of considerations, and and actually the fact that every time people are doing this, they're going to have to work out whether it's um, viable, sensible, practical. All of those things. This, this, the conversation isn't um, a tick box exercise at all. It, it's, mm. it's certainly one for negotiation, it seems to me. Um, and I'm particularly interested personally in, in this conversation about um, skills and making sure that we're pushing that train and making sure that people recognise the opportunities for local development of, uh, uh, of new training um, programmes and national interest in, in this, that there, there will be considerable um, interest and investment over the next few years, I should think. And wouldn't it be great if we could see some of that um, on our side of the country? Um, so that's the really useful fly through. And I apologize for having to chase you at the end there, Diane. Um, the um, question that Damien's put up, in fact, Damien, why don't I just put you on and then you can ask your question of Diane just to get that. Uh, it, it was just an experience that I had uh, when I worked in housing, social housing, 
um, and it was a um, local landlord who purchased um, off the shelf units in a big development in Carlisle. And we had about 16 units, say, so four beds, three beds and two beds. Uh, and I was letting them um, to people on our list. Eh? And the amount of complaints I got about the properties. And when I started then going into these properties uh, and finding out what was going on. Eh? So it was all insulation, just like what the photograph of Diane had sort of uh, given an example of a 2019 new, new build. Eh? We had patio doors where you could fit your hand right under. There was drafts, the boilers were all failing. Insulation was terrible. Eh? Fixtures and fittings were poor and the snags were absolute nightmare. And trying to get the builder, which was a big builder, back to do repairs and retro, um, uh, snag work on, on those properties, even with uh, the National House Builders certificate, eh, was a nightmare. So it, 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 I thought these houses will never last 10 to 15 years uh, based on a lot of the stock that this landlord had was old terraced housing, well weathered and worn, but always sort of stood solid, eh, like, you know what I mean? Uh, so it was just an observation. I think I've, I've spoke to you we talked before, Dan, about this, but uh, given what's going on, um, I think when you said about the PR, the minimum banding sees, uh, that's only four and eight years away. I think that's a big tsunami coming this way. And that that, yeah. that in itself will be uh, a goal post changer there for all, all the landlords. There's a lot in this social housing land, 95% of his, their stock wasn't even decent home standard, eh? I don't know how to wangle around that, eh? and loads of certificates were E's and D's, if you, if you can think about it. So just an observation and just about the dangers of new building. You think they're, they're perfect and don't get a survey and all that sort of stuff. I don't know what our maintenance team would have think about, because they, they must have got surveys or sign-offs on these new buildings. I think there's just picking up a couple of things. Just to emphasise, the consultation is for the private rented sector. So uh, oh. it, it, it's... Um, uh, but, but clearly, you know, some of the landlords, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's, it only closed sort of earlier this month, but, mm. you know, I've had several sort of private landlords uh, getting in touch with me about, you know, thinking about uh, future planning. Mm. Um, we, we do have to be careful with existing buildings and retrofitting them. I, I'm not saying that the people who are doing the work of our doing it in a way that is irresponsible but specification is so important and you have to bear in mind that some of the compliance items present with new builds are not there with existing buildings um, so you need to make specification is everything and uh, having some means of assessing what is actually uh, being completed is really important for a, a project when you're looking at um, delivery of, of uh, retrofit, whether that be one property or a number of properties. Can I just pick up on, on this briefly with Jen, because uh, the question was asked in the chat earlier about your your standards. Um, uh, do, you, do you have a, a target um, SAP rating for your less properties how do you approach this and apologies for putting you on the spot it's not not we're not having a, a go <laughs> it's just useful to hear uh no we, we we don't have a specific target set for ourselves around that but um um most of our properties um obviously they meet and exceed decent home standard but um in terms of of sap then um yeah all of them all private rental sector properties have to be d and above i think just now um isn't it diane it's it, it's e e, e is right. a minimum um, of e. Yeah. Yeah. so currently i think i mean because um yeah because our, our our most of our properties are these you know ancient very poor quality and i think we started off with the impression that they were old so they would be like really sturdy and these would be solidly built and then uh, what a load of nonsense <laughs> no, they weren't at all you know we've got people putting up giant tellies in one house and basically knocking the next door's telly off the wall in the process <laughs> uh, no we, we don't specifically have have those targets but they're kind of becoming more on our radar and we and we've got somebody else asked what staff we've got yeah we, i've got um 
uh, construction safety and compliance um, manager and, and he's being trained in looking at all of that just now but there are absolute direct implications for us financially but um, yeah it's a big one. Yeah yeah thank you for that Jen thanks. Um, I'm conscious we've got just over 10 minutes left and um, I don't want anyone to feel that they've not had an opportunity to raise questions. Have I missed anything in the chat that anybody's wanting to pick up? Please just unmute yourself and get stuck in at this stage. Put your hand up perhaps, let us know. Oh, David, da did you David's want to chip gone. in? Oh, you've just muted yourself, David. Sorry. Oh, God. Right, OK. <laughs> am I unmuted now? I you think are I am. now, yeah. Jolly good. Sorry, I, I know I've missed a bit in the, in the bit while I've been uh, travelling back home. But I just wanted to ask this big issue around skills and capability is, is a big issue in terms of getting people to engage with the whole uh, sort of green skills agenda. I just wonder whether, Diane, knew of any 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 steps to really engage with FE providers and training providers to actually see what they're doing to look at this particular issue? Or is it just, is it just not on their radar screen? I'd just be interested to know your view. Um, I, I, there is a lot going on, but the, 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 so for example, the CITB construction industry training board, um, you know, that they are, about to publish, uh, you know, a whole zero carbon or hope. Well, it's they've been saying for the last three months they're about to publish it um, uh, on zero carbon training. Um, people, you hope that suddenly it's it's all going to be there, but it isn't there at the moment. In talking to, uh, I mean, you'll be aware that you know I, I'm sort of talking to Furness um, and. It wasn't on their it wasn't on their radar at all. Um, you know, they deliver basic, uh, you know, what we'd view as sort of apprenticeship type yeah. things, but that there is nothing at all on anything related to refurbishment, and they are a different set of skills. There, there is stuff being delivered on a you'd say a, a private basis. So, I mean, that photo that I had uh, on there that that's a. Uh, um, a business that set up a training center, they sell products and they've set up a training center, but to deliver in effect, impartial training. Yeah. Um, and there's things like that going on and sort of, uh, 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 I suppose, uh, organizations that fit on the green, what you'd view as the green side of things, but what that's got to become what we normally do. Um, and it, we talk about radical change. If you look at um, Ireland is further ahead on this than or substantially further ahead. Um, and they have a whole approach. They've changed their approach radically to both new build and refurbishment. Um, but they're dealing with a slightly different housing stock to us. You know, they're looking at their classic, you know, six, you know, 50s, 60s bungalows that they've got to deal with not maybe so much of the sort of properties that, that, that we're looking at locally. So there are things happening, but it needs to happen relatively quickly. Um, so, yeah, but what we've got to do is we've got to do our bit, you know, and it's a bit at a time. That's what it's down to. Yeah, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Diane. Diane. Thank you. Um, uh, Charles, did you have your hand up a minute ago? And I did spot you, Julie. So if you if you're just hang up, happy to hang on. Yes, Fran, I I, I did. I mean, again, um, I, my apologies. I had to duck out for a bit for a church service. But um, and I I wish I'd actually done. I wish I I wish I had listened, been able to listen to your entire presentation as opposed to coming right at the end. But just on a very very personal level, um, the. Going going back to your, the last point you're making about the um, minimum standards raising from an E to, to a C for EPCs, etc. It is going to be very, very difficult. A lot of estate type properties, which is basically what we have, most of them are pre, pre First World War, um, solid sandstone, um, no cavity walls, nothing like that 
they are terribly, terribly expensive. They will be very expensive to retrofit yeah. in, in any case. And it will come to the point where a landlord like me is going to look at a cottage that, say, might be worth 140, 150,000 pounds uh, vacant on the open market. It'll need 20, 25K spending on it to bring it up to a C. The, what's the incentive? It's going to be the, so the, the private rental sector could be taking about to take a heck of a hit in the next five years. And that is not good for um, the sector. It's going to eliminate choice. Um, and um, it, it, I don't think it necessarily will drive up house prices, but it will eliminate choice. And in itself, I totally agree that we need to upgrade our, our properties, but there comes a point where the, you look at a financial model and you say, I'm not going to get any rent out of that property for 10 years. Yeah. Why, why am I doing it? And, um, you know, the, 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 there is a fundamental difference between pre, pre First World War properties and post Second World War properties in terms of bringing them up to satisfactory standards. Yeah. And, as, and I said to you at the AGM we had uh, for, um, at uh, Crosby um, a couple of years ago, there's conflicting information and conflicting advice out there, uh, even at the moment, from uh, local authorities in terms of what, what, um, what heating systems to put in, for example. And until there's, uh, we need, a, 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 not so much a standard, but we need to know what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I, I mean, in, in the private rental sector. And I think cl greater clarity is, is required and incentives. Otherwise, people like me are just going to be saying, no, sorry, I'll put the houses on the market and walk away and put the money in, invest the money in something else. Yeah, I mean, I'm, sorry, I'm pessimistic, but I, I, it is something that I really am. I'm feeling that particular pinch. Yeah, I mean, there's clearly been a lot of comments raised to the that, to, to the consultation, and it is just consultation at this this point. I mean, it's previously been um, uh, in, in published documents. It, it you know the the aspiration to get to ban C has been there. It's been previously declared, but Absolutely. this consultation is, yeah. is sort of trying to tie it down. But lots of uh, um, there are clearly tremendous issues in doing it. Um, I mean, one of the one of the problems is that there isn't necessarily, you know, a a right route because of the complexity of these buildings. You know, there may be. A, you know, a group that are reasonably homogenous, that you can do something with, you can have a route with those, but there is no, somebody isn't going to turn around and say, yes, that's definitely what you need to do. There are moves to sort of try and persuade people in terms of supporting this, uh, these changes. There's going to, there's a, 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 later on this year, there will be um, uh, a heating strategy published, um, you know, everybody knows about the drive towards heat pumps at the moment, but that's got to be put into a broader context. So that's something that we're expecting. So that's another bit of the jigsaw that we need to know about. There are there is a, there are moves to say, well, we should be subsidising it far more heavily because we subsidise the production of power stations. And actually, it's a lot cheaper to stop people using the energy. So there's all sorts of debates, uh, you know, about it but I, I wholly agree with you about the difficulty of doing it and it, it, it but people are having going to have to make decisions relatively quickly as to whether they're going to get rid of the houses or whether they're going to put money aside to do those upgrades because I didn't mention it but the the amount of capital that potentially the landlords got to uh, should put in the ceiling is also potentially going to increase so so it's a it that that could it could radically change things that that particular move um, it, it could totally alter the dynamic yeah. uh, you know phenomenally yeah i can understand that and you, you're absolutely right this conversation has been going on for quite some time it's it's mm -hmm. it's nothing new um 
But um, but you know, you know, what I think we'll all have to watch this, on the private rental sector. We'll all have to watch this space. And speaking, you know, with the housing association hat on, um, you know, we're we're we're, we're going to be having to look forward as to what what we do to our housing stock over the uh, over, over the coming years in in terms of of those upgrades. So. Um, I, if you know, I'll, I, I will I will keep monitoring this quite closely, and I know Martha at Eden Housing will be will be in touch with you on a regular basis for these things. So uh, I, I'm sure we won't get dropped off, but it's just a case of making sure we are we're all up to date with what is actually going on. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, that's really, Thanks, Fran. really useful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right, Julie, we've got a couple of minutes left. I don't know whether you're raising a whole new can of worms for us, but do chip in if you'd like to. <laughs> No, I'm going to be super quick. Um, it's just a comment um, on, on the skills issue. Um, so the Cumbrian districts are all working together at the moment on a local authority delivery screen, uh, scheme, not scheme, under Green Homes Grant. And, and part of that is recognising that we need the skills locally to deliver that. You know, it's all part of the government's agenda on building back better and, and upskilling everybody locally. So, you know, there's conversations going on with the LEP and, uh, and it's a great opportunity to upskill our local people to do this work. So, if we're all working together to get that infrastructure in place, it's only going to help this this infrastructure as well, you know, the, the, the empty homes and the community-led housing as well, because hopefully we'll have those skills locally. So it was just to kind of throw that in there that actually, Good. you know, as a district, as a, as a sorry, as a county, we're working at a high level to kind of make sure we've got that capacity. So, sorry, district. just to be to be clear, that's all all the local authority district areas working together yeah. with the local the local economic partnership group. So, yeah, everyone's kind of aware of you know, there's a whole big green agenda, the decarbonisation program, and, and we, you know, we need to be working together to make sure that we've got those skills locally. We're not bringing people, you know, from out of county to do this work when it can be part of the whole, you know, building up the, yeah. the economy post COVID locally as well. So, so it's a conversation that's going on at a high level across the county and probably within each district as well. So it can only help this, you know, these projects as well. Yeah. So just to is, there, is there a time scale for? Uh... I'm not sure how much of this is um out. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so, 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 so so I know that um so Eden have already had funding to do phase one A of Green Homes grants. They're already working with people to deliver that locally. So yeah, this year, I will say, and then okay. not get myself into trouble. <laughs> okay. okay, right. We are on eleven thirty. So I'm feeling that if people need to go, I should let you go and um. I should say my thank you very much is and um, and close the session. Um, I don't want I don't want to stop this conversation. I'd really like us to carry on, um, but perhaps we can find um, other ways of introducing ourselves to each other and picking up the conversation. I'm going to circulate the slides that Diane shared with us and that Jen has shared. Jen, are your contact details on that presentation? Mm. No, they're not, but you've got them and, and I'm happy for them to be shared. Thank you. That's very generous of you. So we'll make sure that we can pursue Diane and Jen and find out as much as we can from them. And, and also, please do contact me and I'll try and introduce you to the people who, um, who, who can help us pursue bits of this conversation. Um, I'm very grateful for you all taking the time. I know some of you are juggling lots of other things in the background. Um, and uh, it's, it's really good to, to have had a, a chance to explore some of these issues together. So I'm going to say cheery bye at this point and thank you all very much indeed. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Fran. Thank Thanks, you. Katie. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.